Uh, welcome. My name is Liz Call. I'm the University Archivist at RIT Archives, RIT Libraries. And you are here for the Timeless Cultural Iconography of Graphic Medicine. Um, and our, our, our prime host is going to be Kyoto Wilbur, um, who I'll introduce to you in a moment. Um, so after a brief introduction from me, uh, we will play. Uh, Kyoto was nice enough to pre-record her presentation. Um, after we listen to that pre-recorded presentation, we're going to open it up for some questions and discussions. Uh, if we got a quiet room, don't worry, we got some talking points. Uh, but hopefully, you know, I, I, I can't imagine that um, Kyoto's presentation won't uh, spark questions. So please be thinking about the questions and what you want to ask, uh, what you want to hear more about. Um, we will, after, like I said, the pre-recorded, we will be um, opening it up for Q&A and &A discussion. If you have a question as, she, as the presentation is happening and you want to put it on the chat, that's fine. I'll be monitoring chat. We will address them uh, in the order in which we see them if we do get any early ones. Um, and so with that, I'm going to kick it off with the brief intro I have. Um, if I can hit next on my slide and have all these screens up. Let's see, here we go. Um, this program was planned in conjunction with the RIT Archives Digital Exhibit, Epi Epidemics, Economics, and Elections, the editorial cartoons of John Scott Club and Elmer Mesner. Um, and I don't, you can see the URL um, that you can type up if you wanna check it out later. Uh, we are designing programming in, um, to complement each of the three E's. So today's program is for epidemics. In late October, we had a program around elections and that was called Analyze This. And in April, we're planning to have a really cool program with an economics faculty member from RIT um, to talk about the economics and the cartoons. And that's still TBD uh, when it's gonna be, but we're hoping in April around tax time. Um, and so the summary of the exhibit, John Scott Club, uh, he lived from 1875 to 1934 and Elmer Mesner, who lived from 1901 to 1979, worked at the Rochester Times Union, a daily newspaper as editorial cartoonist. Together, the over 6,000 cartoons of Club and Mesner span a century of change in Rochester, New York and the United States. Editorial cartoons are snapshots of the culture in which they are created and can be difficult to translate through a modern lens. Collectively, the cartoons address major issues in local United States and international history from World War I and Prohibition to the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement. The curatorial team set out by selecting themes resonant to today and contextualized them for a contemporary audience. This project is an ongoing collaborative, collaborative effort between Rochester Institute of Technology, RIT, archive staff and RIT libraries, digital humanities librarian, RIT faculty and students and a Rochester community member and RIT archives donor, Melissa Hopkins. The vision driving the work behind this project is to make these obscure and essentially hidden cartoons accessible and relatable. In the spirit of inclusion and accessibility, the digital exhibit intentionally steers away from stringent academic scholarship to allow for a myriad of voices to be represented. In addition to integrating the digital exhibit into teaching at RIT, we are creating programming that aspires to draw the members from RIT and beyond to interact and engage with the cartoons featured in the exhibit. Epidemics, economics, and elections will continue to evolve as RIT faculty and students from a wide range of disciplines and members of the larger Rochester community create responses in all mediums to the cartoons. We are excited to have you with us for this program and want to give a big thanks again to New York City-based artist and educator, Kyoto Wilberg. Kyoto uses comics, oops, it's not official until I have her name up, um, uses comics, needlework, historical studies, bioethics, and her experiences from her career as a massage therapist and health science educator to explore body and science narratives. Her book, Draw Stronger, Self-Care for Cartoonists and Visual Artists, is published by Uncivilized Books. Her mini-comic, Silver Wire, was nominated for 2019 Ignaz IGNATZ Award, Kyoto's drawn and embroidered comics that have appeared in 4panel.ca, Comics for Choice, The Graphic Canyon, Intima, Journal of Narrative Medicine, and Strumpet 5, among others. Once the inaugural, I can't say that word, artist, uh, artist in residence at the New York Academy of Medicine Library, she's now the 
AIR in the Master's Scholars Program in Humanistic Medicine at NYU Grossman School of Medicine, which she teaches graphic medicine and drawing. So now we're gonna start the TAPE program. Um, again, like I said, I'll be monitoring chat. So if you have any questions that come up, uh, know that I'll have my eyes on it, but, but I'll save it until after um, the TAPE presentation portion is done. Today, I'm showing some highlights from my graphic medicine in a pandemic workshop offered through RIT's Center for Engaged Storycraft during the fall 2020 semester. And I'll present student work based on a collaborative cartooning research project using historical cartoons from the RIT archives digital exhibit, Epidem Epidemics, Economics and Elections, the editorial cartoons of John Scott Club and Elmer Messner. Then we'll open things up for questions and a discussion. So first I'm going to shrink myself down, put myself in a corner. That looks good. And turn on the slides and get my pointer out. Okay. Uh, here is an image. Uh, this slide Death Tramples Three Female Allegorical Figures Representing Sensual Pleasures is a pen and ink drawing circa 1700 from the Welcome Collection online. During this workshop, we explored historical and contemporary comics, paintings, illustrations, and other narrative artworks from many different sources. Uh, they communicated the shared experiences of pandemic survivors from plague to cholera to HIV AIDS to COVID-19. So for fun, I thought I would start with this image for a quick look at some historical death iconography. Certainly iconography changes over time, but although very few of us are currently familiar with the hand sides, such as these and their uses, uh, we can still recognize the shrouded image of death. Here is a skeleton. And um, death is holding an hourglass which also represents aging and the passage of time. Uh, with a little additional study, we would also recognize the sensual activities death victims are engaged in. Uh, during the workshop, we explored iconic images and their narratives for inspiration to create our own contemporary graphic medicine comics about the current pandemic. Graphic medicine was employed as our means of building narrative drawing skills. We took time to compare our lives to the lives of others. We explored our relationships to complex personal, social, political, and public health events. And we made comics using multidisciplinary methods. Students wrote, drew, and created their stories using the media of their choice. In-class exercises and homework assignments were shared and discussed amongst the class to exchange ideas compare graphic and narrative choices, identify intent and message, and improve our skills as storytellers. This diary comic uh, by Holly Morgan shows us the personal and communal stresses of masking and illustrates its complex symbolism. Our current pandemic has profoundly altered aspects of our lives that we may not have anticipated as vulnerable to a public health crisis. Our stories about work, relationships, social activities, and more are now influenced by national public health measures. By improving our understanding of epidemiology, identifying healthcare inequities, recognizing prejudice, reflecting on our own experiences of the pandemic, and making lots of comics, students recognized and expressed their multiple relationships to the pandemic. Focus on shared knowledge and personal experiences of COVID-19 provided a pathway to further develop artistic voices. Exploring past health crises while grappling with a new pandemic can provide emotional distance as we study past acts of isolation, blaming, racism, othering, sacrifice, caregiving, and charity that have been poignantly reenacted during this nation's health crisis. Here is an image from the San Francisco paper, The Wasp from 1882. We see the shrouded specters of malaria, smallpox, and leprosy. 
and they are haunting the port of San Francisco. And we also see Chinatown as a part of their shroud. Uh, references to ports can symbolize trade as well as contact with pathogen bearing foreigners. Although there is a distance reference also here to butcher town and a hospital. Chinatown is depicted as the locus of disease. Unfortunately, the visual techniques of othering and labeling a group of people, in this case, Asian immigrants, as, as a contaminated threat still survives in contemporary comics making. In exploring graphic narratives about past health crises, we analyze the moral and ethical visual messages associated with disease and epidemics. We experience the cartoonists' trust and distrust of medicine and science. We appreciate their depictions of sacrifice and caregiving. We make comics and build empathy for other pandemic survivors. Then we can compare these universal narratives, find their relevance to our own experiences, discover ways to constructively share centuries old yet deeply personal experiences in a voice unique to us and in the language of our time. Uh, here is an in-class exercise by Hannah Speech expressing anxiety about being infected with COVID-19. In her case, the specters of disease are viruses and the carrier of infection is of the same gender and physical type as the newly infected subject. I'm going to move a moment so you can see the whole thing. There we go. Because the protagonist and antagonist are so similar in appearance, we are able to focus on the anxiety of the situation and lay blame on a behavior going out in public while sick, rather than laying blame on a group of people. Welcome to my desktop. The R online RIT archive collection is a fantastic resource for students to access during the pandemic. Working digitally, the librarians have set up information so that we can understand the messages communicated in these historical documents. This format piques our curiosity and pulls us deeper into the collection. We are able to research a curated collection, experience the thrill of discovery, and wonder at the artistic prowess of those cartoonists working with pen and paper in formats for newspapers public, published a century ago. Digital exploration of the collection is at present a necessary public health protocol, but I can't wait for the collection to be available once again for in-person examination. As a past research fellow and artist, I can assure you that although digital collections are highly useful and stimulating to explore, they cannot replace the awe inspired by actually touching and examining historical ephemera in person. Let's look at this cartoon, uh, Patiently Waiting, drawn by Elmer Messner in 1945. So look in the corner and you will see a coffee stain. Uh, uh, I can tell that stain was made before Messner turned in the piece because it's under whiteout used to sharpen the borders and mask some lettering mistakes. So here we can see it was whiteout. The word helpless needed to be rewritten. The whiteout is sharpening borders and it's overlying that coffee stain. So the coffee stain was made first. To see marks made by the cartoonist's hand and the use of whiteout on actual artifacts provides us with technical and intuitive data about materials, rendering techniques, and requirements for reproduction when the work was made. Incidental beverage stains, notes, and other embellishments give the work additional gossipy personal excitements. The sensory experience, the look, feel, weight, sound, and smell of archive materials enhances the uniqueness of the research adventure and emphasizes the delicacy and value of the objects under scrutiny. Digital collections are great, but physical collections are the gold standard for research and inspiration.
During the fifth week of the workshop, Liz Call was our guest presenter. She introduced the students to the RIT Archive Editorial Cartoons Collection and shared methods for researching articles from historical Rochester newspaper databases. The students were given an assignment to explore the epidemic section of the archives exhibit featuring digital scans of original cartoon artwork created by John Scott Club and Elmer Messner between the years 1919 and 1960. They browsed the collection, selecting a cartoon that appealed to them for any reason. For additional context, they then used the database to find an article reporting on the topic of their cartoon. The next step was to find parallels between the message of the selected comic and our country's current struggle with the COVID-19 crisis or other contemporary public health issues. After that, they wrote a short paragraph about what attracted them to the comic and created a comic about the COVID-19 pandemic or another current public health issue inspired by the historical cartoon. So, although no one picked this particular image, A Winter's Tale, drawn by John Scott Club in 1926, it is one of my favorites. We see winter stalking around Rochester and on its tail, so here's winter, and on its tail are assorted flu, colds, grip, sniffles, and fever germs, personified as these spiky little creatures wearing spiky little hats. And here they are, clinging to the tail. Uh, where was I? There we are. Okay. They are gleefully chatting about closing schools, sending sick cops home, and hanging out on public transportation. Even though virology was still in its early phases, the effects of these pathogens were well documented. Now we will see the cartoon each student selected from the collection, learn what attracted them to the particular work, and then see their image in response. Holly Morgan says, I was attracted to this comic by the simplicity of it and the clarity of the hovering looming vultures, which telegraph that something is already dying on its own before the vultures land and tear it apart even further. The inclusion of a seemingly impartial observer only makes it worse as this figure isn't actively moving in to assist. Holly also says, from the perspective of someone responding to the situation, it gives a very easy play of America in the iconic form of Uncle Sam observing Germany from the outside and someone like me seeing the same signs from the inside, physically, in terms of social distancing, but also having to be here in the US during the pandemic election mess. And this is um, Messner's hovering over from 1947. And now let's look at Holly's comic. There we go. Holly's appropriation of Messner's cartoon updates his political iconography. Instead of the vultures labeled famine, disease, and communism, she is witnessing COVID, the Second Civil War, and fascism. And as she stated, her division of events witnessed as an insider and outsider aptly contextualizes the location of a personal perspective and experiences during the COVID-19 shutdown. Her use of color directs the reader's eye. Those purple mountains um, are a deliberate invocation of the patriotic song, America the Beautiful. Her portrayal of printed media has evolved from a paper Hoover report to an online headline. On a technical level, I also appreciate that we can see the not completely erased pencil marks that are intrinsic to the comics making process of penciling, inking, and then coloring one's cartoon. I see this use of media, of media as an homage to Messner's media of choice. Yilmaz, the student who chose this particular image says, I chose irresistible because it almost perfectly reflects the situation certain people are facing in the fight for better public health care and social programs that are being impeded by politicians. He includes this quote from the Social Security website's timeline. 
1960, Arthur S. Fleming, in testimony before the Ways and Means Committee, stated, I want to make it clear that as an administration, we will oppose any program of compulsory health insurance, which, Yilma says, reflects Senator Mitch McConnell's unwillingness to pass through bills and stimulus checks that would benefit Americans who cannot afford basic health care and are also on the verge of losing their coverage due to pre-existing conditions like COVID. And here is Yilmaz's cartoon in response. Yilmaz appropriates the elements of Messner's cartoon, the boulder, the steep hill, and uh, the bodies of our government. And here we have the Senate. Um, and to replicate and comment on the push from some of our elected representatives for financial relief from the pandemic from, for US citizens. He also reverses the direction of the struggle. Mitch McConnell's opposition is the force about to create the downhill plummet of the legislative boulder. So that's Mitch McConnell's hand. Here's the recess. And here is the boulder representing COVID relief money. I believe Yilmaz made this piece in Photoshop or with some other drawing software and selected brushes that give a bit of an homage to Mesner's line and shading. For inspiration, Hannah's speech picked a cartoon not authored by Club or Mesner. She says, in the Democrat and Chronicle issue on January 28, 1953, there was a comic on page five that stood out to me. The illustration consisted of a woman standing under a porch light, holding cash and smiling. It reads, turn on your porch light, fight polio tonight. According to the Chronicle, women from Rochester canvassed houses on their mother's march on polio day during this evening. They went from door to door, if the porch lamp was on, to collect contributions for patients with polio, as well as for further research on the uncured disease. The comic is appealing to me because of the warm and welcoming nature the lamp and the woman portray to the viewer, especially since there were no cell phones or email during that time. This seemed a much more personable way to communicate with the community and work together to fight the disease. And here is in this comic. As does the porch light cartoon, Hannah's work also provides a simple playful image combined with a slogan to encourage activities that promote public health and combat a pandemic in one's community. Each cartoon also uses simple line work to target a specified age and gendered reader. The artist of the porch light cartoon has the advantage of drawing their subject's entire face to communicate expression, while Hannah had to communicate a friendly attitude on a masked figure. I'd also like to point out that the the depictions of winking are tough to illustrate because they are static. However, Hannah's playful slogan and inviting character help us understand this person is indeed winking. Her left eyelid is not just closed. While we're here, Let's take a moment for Elmer Messner's polio cartoon from the same January 28th, 1953 paper, depicting the mother's march on polio. Again, the porch light plays a key factor and the woman on the porch is also holding money, but this time in a donation jar. Additionally, Messner has drawn a wraith-like image of a child disabled like polio as a visual reminder of the cause of the fund drive. Sarah Calhoun says she chose John Scott Club's 1919 comic, making him stick to his bed will be Doc's big job now because of its simplicity and anchoring message that can be tied to the reality of today's healthcare system. While quite visually pleasing in shading and form, there are thematic details throughout the comic that for me, meaning for Sarah, hint as to why our medical system operates the way it does today. For example, the fact that the re-election tonic, which is here, is only granted by the doctor upon opposing compulsory or universal health insurance indicates the doctor's opposition 
to government mandated insurance in hospitals, since that would interfere with his own pay and patient list. Anti-government thought processes like this have led to a greater increase in modern day private medicine practices that divide the healthcare system into those who can and those who cannot afford the right to live. These themes of money over well-being are depicted in the comic through the pills scattered about the floor rather than neatly given to the patient. And here are the pills. While in 1919, people did not experience the healthcare system, inflation, or wage rate the same way as in 2020, this comic demonstrates the seeds planted in the political climate that have led to repercussions of today. And for those reasons, I was drawn to this comic for further discussion. Sarah went on to do additional research, reading articles from historical and contemporary newspapers, organizational brochures, and websites. She used their excerpted text as text for her cartoons. And here is her cartoon. Both cartoons tackle the issue of compulsory health insurance as their topic, although Sarah's cartoon inhabits a postmodern style because of her use of found text. Her piece and that of Club both require scrutiny of the entire image on the page. In both cases, environment is an intrinsic component of its message. Sarah begins her piece with the statement here. Private health care and, and insurance works because it was built upon denying the poor and the underprivileged. The dirt under the grave is textured by text from an article asking, can the American people afford medical care? And the answer here is yes. Contradicting Sarah's statement above, the, the text of the grave draws our eyes down to other quotes from the experiences of a disabled man and his dying aunt. Buried under this controversy and lived experience is a coffin. So these are statements from the man about caring for his aunt. Here is the coffin. And then the final text, it says, here is the bed in which we, we must lie. Okay, now I'm going to make myself big again. Whoops. I can attest through personal experience that we can rely on our histories to help us through new crises. I believe that with research, reflection, and creative exploration, we can benefit from the historic gifts other artists survivors have left us. Even if those gifts are messages of prejudice and hate, their power can inspire and challenge us to act for inclusion and love during times of crisis. Some of these gifts are waiting for you at the RIT Library Archive Collection. I urge you to take advantage of the work RIT's librarians have put into preserving, cataloging, and representing this material online just for us. Thank you. That was great, thank you. Uh, kia ora. <laughs> really, <laughs> uh, every time I look at the cartoons through other people's eyes, I see something different. So it's so great. Um, just trying to get to the next slide to signify our discussion QA portion. I haven't seen anything come in over the chat, um, but if anybody would like to has a question or wants to kick this off, um, let me know before we get started. Sorry. Sorry, I'm a little bit dark here, but I'm wearing my RIT sweatshirt. Um, I just wondered, um, the, the work that the students did was really, really great. And I'm wondering, are you planning on adding them to your archive? Great question, Kari. We actually, we have, um, we have put it on our digital exhibit um, so you can see under student work, we have a link to the class and it gives information about the class and then all the students work next to the um, original art that they were reacting to, as well as a blurb about why they picked the piece they did. Yeah, well, what I, I was wondering, um, were you going to have, I mean, I know you might not have their original drawings, but like for, 
I know that you're having digitally and you'll save it for posterity, but should there be a pandemic a hundred years from now to, to have students see the work that these students did would be super awesome. Yeah. yeah, and I think, I'm sorry, I don't know, but um, we are in the archi RIT archives creating an RIT um, COVID collection. Uh, we have done some components of it, um, and, but now we're trying to formulate their outreach to faculty like Kyoto um, and others who have, because it's been a lot that students have been creating with faculty and classes this past year that we want to be able to bring into the archives because you're right. I mean, the reflection a hundred years, I mean, we're looking at it um, like, from this vantage point, we were looking for like 1918 stuff, right? For the flu. And there's not a whole bunch. Well, there's stuff, but not like the cartoons don't necessarily reflect what was going on. And so it'd be great to have that. Uh, yeah. Kyoto, did you want to add anything? Um, yes, uh, I agree. The work is really fantastic. And it was really a treat to work with these students and, you know, and kind of experience their perspectives on the pandemic and also their historical perspectives. And I can imagine that if other students come across their work, you know, 50, 100 years from now, it will definitely like also, again, trigger like similar responses and could like really um, still like be relevant and meaningful work to, you know, uh, other college students in the future to just see this kind of work and, you know, to experiment with making their own. Um, so, and uh, yeah, okay, I'll leave it at that for now. And then we'll get on to other things later. Um, and I see Denise has um, in the chat asked, do we get to see any of your recent work, Kyoto? Um, I didn't, uh, I wasn't planning on showing any of my work here. Um, if you're curious about my work, you could go to my blog, which is uh, Kriota Velt, K R I O T A W E L T dot blogspot dot com, and kind of browse through different pages um, and take a look at things that I've been up to. Uh, I've been, for the past year, I'm working, I'm working on a book right now. It's a 200 page book about surgery. So I have been doing some projects, but um, it's not quite as packed in the recent, in the recent year. Um, but yeah, you can still, you can still get a sense of my work and see what I'm, what I'm up to. I just, I do have to put a plug in for um, the, the graphic, um i don't know the silver wire oh yeah graphic cart to a uh, comic graphic comic oh how, what's the official what's the genre well it's a it's a graphic medicine mini comic okay um <laughs> you can the the mini comic itself the paper version has a 19 page story which is followed by eight pages of notes and citations <laughs> and um so uh, there's that version of it. There's also an online version of it on medium.com, but without the historical references at the end. Um, but medium, uh, you get so many articles free before you have to subscribe. So if people are curious, you know, they can always look at it that way as well. Um, but you can find things about Silver Wire on my blog and uh, it's probably one of the best pieces I've ever done, frankly. So it's it's phenomenal. I mean, thank it's, you. I I am not just saying that. Yeah, I was reading it because I, and then and when you read it, it's when you get to the end and you're like, that's the title. It's just amazing. So I can't imagine the amount of work and research you did because the one I have does have all the citations, and that's from the time you were at the New York Academy, Academy of Medicine Library. Yeah, in New York City. I mean, that's. That's it's a, it. Must have taken. How long did that take to produce that whole? Um, well, I was I was at the academy for about nine months. I was doing a lot of research. Um, I was also while I was working on that comic, I was also doing a number of other projects and work. So it took me about a year actually to like write, draw, and produce the produce the book. 
Um, one thing about that book that was a real, uh, a real um, um, stimulus for me and like kind of article of growth for me was that I got to a point in the making of that work where I really started to realize you can't convince people of anything with data if they don't want to believe you. So you, so data and references and you know ways to back up the accuracy of your information are obviously very useful. But then also when we're trying to um, persuade people to like actually own up to certain events or like understand, fully understand and accept historical events or philosophies or whatever. Also the argument uh, needs to be emotional because <laughs> most people aren't willing to just read a brochure about statistics and then go, oh yes, absolutely. I should get vaccinated or I should blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like things don't work that way. So Silver Wire for me was also like a real, um, a real attempt to kind of blend these two ideas, like blend these ideas of like data and experience and, you know, try to use these arguments to like make a point. So yeah, like I said, I think it's the best thing I've ever done. I may never like make anything that good again, but that's okay. Cause um, yeah, I'm really proud of it. So thank you. That was a good question. Um, thank you, Denise. Did Anybody else, did we, maybe we'll just jump on to what we were gonna talk a little bit about um, highlighting, cause you talk, bring it up in your, um, in your presentation, but I think it's so interesting when you talk about, you know, um, getting it, you know, reading the, you know, the racism and the racist tropes that, uh, that are kind of um, put into cartoons and assumed and, and just kind of highlighting that. Uh, so uh, we, we picked on this one. This is a, a club, John Scott Club from 1926 um, that you could talk a little bit about and what drew you to this and the sort of uh, some of the theories that you're kind of, um, if you want to expound upon any of the theories that you have. Sure. So um, one thing also in my experiences as a massage therapist um, and like working with different um, holistic communities uh, is that even within the course of um, engagement with communities that are like very mindful of health and other types of things, when people fall ill, either, you know, with cancer or maybe with COVID or whatever, there's still often, for some people, there's still like a kind of blame the victim, blame the patient kind of mentality. It's like, oh, you must have done something wrong and now you're paying the price and it's kind of your fault when frankly, sometimes it's just bad luck or, you know, whatever. And also within the context of cartoons and art, there can also be like moralizing and essentially blaming the patient for, you know, whatever their affliction is. And this, and this can also bring us down to ideas around mental health and other like public health issues. And um, if you look at this cartoon, uh, it's of a mayor, right? With the hatchet, with the ax of uh, enforcement of law, order and decency, which is definitely a moral statement, right? It's like the decent thing to do. Um, and he's breaking into a filthy dive. And the idea that like there's a miasma bad air, right, coming out of this dive that includes crime and vice, which again is like a moralistic label, and disease and drunkenness, like all of these essences are coming out. And again, they're opposing decency, like, absolutely, like, you know, gives us a taint to things that are sometimes out of people's controls, or things that they may be struggling with. Um, also, if you look, so the, the social messages around illness, around public health issues, um, you know, all, and like, you know, all of this stuff is really kind of fascinating to me. And I'm very interested in um, having my students explore these messages, interpret them, analyze them mindfully, 
and then like choose to accept them or not. So also when we look at this image, you can see there's synthetic gin in the corner, there's dope, there's bootleg. And then right next to that is a razor and a dagger, a deck of playing cards, and then poison hooch. And then also on the ground by the steps is a cup of dice. So behaviors like gambling are being associated with um, alcohol and drug use and um, also associated with violence and associated with as being the antithesis of decency. So there's a lot of message in here that takes a moral high ground that I find really uh, discomforting. And, you know, this, and these types of messages are still present today in different contexts. So, um, so yeah, so uh, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of, for whatever reason, I am kind of attracted to reading ethical messages or moral messages embedded in things. So not just the negative ones, also the positive ones, but this happened to be a part of the collection and I just found it very interesting. Um, oh, actually, hey, Sarah, are you around? Yeah. <laughs> yeah Sarah was one of the, Sarah, you saw her work at the very end. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk about your experience looking through the collection, like what kind of like you picked this particular image, but also just like some ideas around how you were interpreting messages and what was attractive to you. Do you mind? Yeah. Um, so I think what struck me the most when we were going through them is like how much things were similar between now and back then. It was just perceived through like a different lens. Um, so with some of these, I mean, like the political messages were pretty much the same, but we just now see them in different forms. So um, it's weird to hear arguments going on in like today's climate that um, not just that things are different, but like that, I can't think of the right word for it. Like, I feel like there's this perception between like things in politics and things in health that things that are old never come back or recur again. They're just like outdated and we can like throw them aside and we don't have to think about them anymore. Um, but when you look at these, it's clearly not the case because like as people were going through the exact same things. So it just felt important when we were doing this part of the class to really reflect on like what we can take from like the stigmas that we saw back then and like the lessons that they learned or took away from it or how they responded poorly to things. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and since, of things. Yeah, and since we were in a, an election, like in the throes of the election process also, I can see, I can see how the insurance and the political themes like kept coming up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit maybe also about uh, the way you used text in your piece? I feel like it's very yeah. postmodern, <laughs> but that's just me, right? But yeah. um, can you talk about that a little bit? Just like the process um, for making the work? Yeah. So I think for this one, what ended up happening was that I did, I went sort of down a rabbit hole of research when I didn't need to, and it got time to make the comic. And I was like, well, how do I put all of like what I just gathered into like so little? So that's where I had to like um, do the overlay of the newspapers. And some of the stuff that is included in there is modern text. So I think the top one that I have is one from the 60s and then the two down below are from the 90s and then the 2000s. So it was, it felt crucial to include like that sort of timeline in it. So like realize that like things haven't changed so that we could make this argument that like, yes, we do still have to address the situation um, and how like, how poor responses made before or like more, uninformed responses made before in previous times still impact us today. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if that and, makes sense to everyone. Yeah, and you're also voicing one of the, um, 
one of the big challenges of making comics and doing graphic medicine, which is you have all this data and all this information, yeah. and you, you know, you have an assignment. And in this case, it was like, okay, you know, make a page. And how do you like, how do you condense and then incorporate like everything you've learned, you know, into the, to fulfill the assignment. So. Yeah. It's yeah. a lot of like minimizing or like simplifying um, things to get it across like really quick. Yeah. Yeah. It was excellent. It was really, yeah, that was, it might, yeah, be neat to reference what year, you know, so you knew that you were really displaying a century in this little cartoon. Yeah. Yeah, it was wild doing all that research. I'm really glad that like we were shown this as a resource because I ended up going back and looking at it because it was just, it was really wild to see like what was put out for public view in the media back then. You just made my night. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was also such a pleasure to see every, you know, we had four students in the workshop. It was a real pleasure to like see everybody's work you know, it's like, I feel like everyone's work reflects their creative personality and also their lived experience, you know, who they are. It was just really, it was really a treat for me to just, you know, work with everybody and, you know, see how they responded to my challenges, essentially. So it was, it was really a great experience. Well, I mean, one thing we wanted to touch upon was just the, um, the whole, the process, how we worked to work together. Um, it was very, it was really serendipitous, right? I mean, uh, I believe Daniel Warden had reached out to a couple of people who um, teach with, um, he knows that teach with comics and he's a faculty member at RIT. I believe he's at the School of Individualized Study um, and he teaches excellent comics classes and he's an excellent faculty member. Um, and, um, and, he reached out to Kyoto was one of the people. <laughs> so uh, that was like, I'm interested. And that was how it started. But I do see in the chat, um, Kari has a question for Sarah when you are done. So before I, I can keep on about this, about the process, but I'd rather hear your question, Kari, and then we can come back. I don't want to interrupt, but <laughs> you're, but you were, I was just, I was typing. I'm like, oh, when you're done. <laughs> um, so Sarah, I was just wondering like how this, I think you're in the school of film and animation, right? Yeah. And I was just wondering how this sort of workshop that seemed really, really interesting may, do you have, has it informed your filmmaking thinking? I mean, it obviously has informed your storytelling thinking, but have you, has this sparked ideas for like a little film? short um it's well okay when I took this class it was actually kind of coincidental because I'm working on my thesis right now for SOFA mm -hmm. and it's about death and like how we visualize it now so like this class came in at the perfect time um I think mostly what I took away from it was like how we can critically think about these kinds of things because like up until that point in the pandemic I was sort of just like you know you kind of just like go with it you're like this is the new normal but you don't really think about it as like oh I'm actually like living through this and there's previous history and like how this happened so I think it really shaped like how I personally view it but also how I view it on a societal level too mm -hmm. so I hope it shows in my film or any other work I do later on but yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful that I took this class. It just came in at like a, a perfect opportunity time. Cool, cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, I won't ask any more questions. Oh, please keep on. I mean, I love hearing um, questions, especially after the students who took the course. So thank you for uh, being comfortable being put on the spot, <laughs> Sarah, and for your answers. But I know there's a couple of other students in the class. So uh, if anybody else wanted to speak about their experience taking the class or wading through these historic cartoons and these resources to try to understand them, we would love to hear from you. I know I, I saw a couple like, names from your class, right? Here, there, I think some of um, I don't think they're here. Oh, no? Okay. Yeah. Somebody had to work. And... Oh, that's where it was. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. <laughs> but it's great to hear that. I know people are very interested in how people 
you know, the whole artist um, process, right? So thank you, Sarah, that was really, and your piece is just really interesting. And especially hearing you talk about that, I wouldn't have necessarily known that all of the, the century of information on this single cartoon. So this is, this is really awesome. Thank you. Um, and it speaks further to the, the possibilities that um, working with archives has with, with supporting the curriculum and teaching at RAT. Um, there's many different ways that we, that can be spun, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be the way that Kyoto ran her class or work, but I think a key word for me when, I, when Sarah said, um, you know, helped her critically, you know, think critically, right? And, and, and looking at historic artifacts like these cartoons or reading through historic newspapers makes you look at the world today differently, right? More critically. And that's so, that's so key, that word critical and thinking critically engaging, thinking for ourselves. You know, I think that inspires curiosity and creativity, you know? And, you know, I also think that for some people, um, understanding that, you know, humankind has gone through like, these incredible challenges in the past and survived, you know, kind of lived to make work about it, lived to make art about it, write about it, music, whatever. You know, sometimes that sense that, oh, okay, someone else has done this, they got through it, I can get through it too, can actually be a bit of a psychic relief and like gives you a way to learn from someone else's experience. Um, so that I think was also like a key factor for me in wanting to like, you know, include this, you know, include this experience with researching the collection. And again, like I said, you know, I'm a research, I'm a research addict. So, you know, there's really, there's really, um, there can really be some, uh, a sense of discovery that like, and again, the sense of discovery that you're experiencing this for the first time kind of implies that nobody else knows what's going on. Even if you're looking at a website where, you know, people browse through all the time, but like making that kind of connection to the work really like gives you a personalized and unique experience. And again, helps you bring these historical pieces like into your own lived experience. And so, you know, I think that's also very important, something I wanted to I wanted to emulate. And yeah, so when Daniel introduced us, it was just like, oh my gosh, this is, this is a perfect opportunity. Um, so it was great. Uh, we have another question in the chat um, from Audra. This is in reference to the cartoon about immigration in Italy. The figures were men with two of them with, okay, so the men in the cartoons had women's scarves on. Yeah, they were, they were all, if you look at the figures, they're all men. But the first one that he put a, put a scarf, the one holding the baby, that was really a man holding the baby. And then, <laughs> yeah, I was just trying to figure out what's up with that all men. <laughs> well, you know, I'll tell you something. Sometimes as a cartoonist, uh, you know, you need visual reference. And sometimes you can't find what you need to look at. So like, you know, my husband is also a cartoonist and sometimes he and I will like ask each other to pose. Oh, okay. But, you know, it could be that, uh, I think that was a Mesner cartoon. It could be that Mesner was just like in the, you know, in the office one day or something and only had a mirror or like only had some other guy to look at and was just drawing the people around him. Okay. <laughs> and then putting on like, you know clothing or other symbols like having holding a child whatever that would like symbolize gender yeah okay <laughs> yeah and sometimes if you're stuck in a room only with your mirror with a mirror which <laughs> now that the internet has opened things up it's easier to find you know like more diverse images but sometimes like everybody in a comic strip or something will look suspiciously like the author of that comic strip. You mean, you mean he couldn't close his eyes and think about his wife or his girlfriend? Come on. Uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes it can be really hard to draw from imagination. Like, okay. especially like if you look at this artwork, that's another thing. Like this artwork, there's a lot of like realism to it. You know, like these guys are really hung up on making things look accurate and not too exaggerated right so i think that 
I suspect that there was like a little reference glitch in there somehow. So. Although thinking about accuracy, just, just now it struck me, the guy in bed um, for the last cartoon that's still up on the screen. Uh -huh. He looks like, I don't know if you guys remember that magazine. It's still out, Mad Magazine. Doesn't this yeah. have a character from that? Alfred E. Newman? Is that, is that is it around? But that's a, that's sort of a funny, yeah, because they, they, there's a lot of realism. And I was talking to, uh, there was a, for our opening event, we had um, Phil Hands, who's a political cartoonist, um, talk a little bit about the cartoons um, and then interject his work in there. And he mentioned that one strategy that they especially did back then was trace oh. uh, pictures of people. So like, the, and that's why they're so like, they look like pictures essentially. And he said, sometimes he'll still use that tactic once in a while. Oh, you know, tracing, I, there's a lot of sketching, tracing of sketches and then like going back in and reworking. Um, yeah, tracing is actually harder than it sounds. <laughs> um, and also these guys at the time they had to trace through tracing paper and then like put maybe put a light box behind their sketch to like actually like pencil the work onto bristol board or a thicker board so you know like it was a very complex it, it was a very complicated system to do it um but um but yeah you know like a lot of artists trace and they're still an incredibly skilled artist because tracing is actually really hard <laughs> i'm not yeah that was not me describing yeah. um yeah. Or, and, and phil wasn't talking down about tracing yeah 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 and when you think about it too i mean these, they this turnover i mean these guys you know uh scott john scott club and um mesner well elmer mesner were doing this every day they had to yeah. get one to two cartoons out yeah yeah mm -hmm. and and if you look at this if you look at this cartoon here right um, you know, he's using a, he's using a pen. So you would have to do a sketch, then you would have to like refine your sketch. Then you would use a pen and probably a dipping pen. So this guy had to, every time he started to run out of ink, he'd have to like take the time to dip the pen. And frankly, I'll tell you having pens now with like an instilled ink source is like, oh, so much faster. And then also drawing on the computer is even faster than that. You know, it's like, Technology keeps making things better, but um, you know, being able to look at the line work, like the use of whiteout, like how these how these guys would like you know crank out these crank out these pieces that are like highly technical pieces, is really awe inspiring and fascinating. I think for artists to like look at the work of other people and see how they were doing it, um, you know. So uh, yeah, <laughs> it's like. Again, looking at the collection, when the collection is finally open again, I hope everybody is just like pounding on the library doors saying, let me look at those comics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, and, and for those who may or may not know, uh, the library is going to be undergoing some renovations for the next couple of years. And we will, at the end of it, in archives, have a new spiffy space on the third floor. We're staying on the third floor. Uh, but starting, uh, the archives are currently closed right now altogether. We were have, allowing researchers um, to make appointments and now we're completely closed as we prep to the move to our interim location in July. But, um, you know, we will make announcements and updates along the way to let everybody know what's going on because we are hoping in our interim space to be able to facilitate researchers and classes um, if they're in person or remote or whatever. So it's not like we're shutting down and going dark, uh, but, we're, but we're still very much working out the details of this move. <laughs> so that was a good segue. I wanted to mention that just so it's not a surprise to anybody. And of course, if people have questions or, and, and we're gonna try to be, you know, as, um, you know, forthcoming with updates uh, through social media and um, through the library's website. I know we have a, a construction update portion of our website that are, uh, that Sarah, our marketing manager, has put out and is going to be updating. So, um, you know, that is happening. It is kind of a big deal. <laughs> um, but we do want to create access and we are hoping to put up, we have only an, a several, like we have about like 25 to 28 of the cartoons, maybe it's a little more than that, on the digital exhibit of Mesner and clubs. And we, we do have like thousands of them, almost all of them digitized. So we do hope in the next year or so to be able to put those up on our 
um, digital content management system so that you can see them all. Um, but that, that does take a number of, a lot of work. Even though we haven't digitized, we have to figure it, clean up the metadata. So there's a lot of back-end work we have to do to get it up, but we do hope to do that. Um, so I just want to, again, um, you know, thank, thank Kyoto again for her time uh, and, and, and for doing this presentation because the class was, sounded awesome. And it was so great to be able to work with her students in the workshop. And I was so happy to hear that's being offered in the fall to give another plug for it. <laughs> And thank you, Sarah, for being willing to uh, <laughs> talk a little bit about your work for us, too. That was great to have you here. Yeah. So um, thanks, everybody. We, Like I said, I will be emailing out once this is up on our YouTube channel, um, the link, and it will be put on our digital exhibit, too. Um, and you see up on the screen right now, if you have any questions, please feel free to email us at ritarchive at rit.edu. Um, and thanks. It was great having you all. This was a great program. Thank you again, Kyoto. And thank uh, you, Liz. See you all soon, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs>